All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this virtual book talk presented by New America, the political reform program at New America, which is the part of New America that thinks about how our democracy might work a little bit better. And today I am super excited because we have some of my very favorite political scientists to have the conversation that we are all thinking about, which is how much of a threat is our democracy under right now? And uh, we have an incredibly timely book uh, by Suzanne Mettler and Robert Lieberman uh, called Four Threats uh, to American Democracy. Uh, or four, sorry, the book is called Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. And uh, we all, so we have Robert Lieberman, who's a professor of American institutions at, uh, or sorry, Suzanne Mettler, who's a professor of American institutions at Cornell University. Robert Lieberman, who's the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. And then with us today, we also have uh, two esteemed uh, discussions. We have Megan Ming Francis, who's an associate professor of political science at Johns at the uh, University of Washington, and Didi Kuo, who's the associate director uh, for research and the senior research scholar at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. And I'm Lee Drutman, uh, senior fellow in the political reform program at New America, and I'll be moderating this event. So uh, I, I want to get it started with uh, Suzanne and Robert to tell us what are the four threats and how have they recurred throughout our political history? Okay, thank you so much, Lee. And uh, we're absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you for welcoming us to New America. And uh, we're so happy to have this con have the opportunity to have this conversation with Dee Dee and Megan and you as well, Lee. Um, so yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, I think, for Rob and I to have written a book that you know you've described as timely. Um, you know, of course, we all want to write a book that is timely. Except um, for the two of us, I think this means that we're not getting much sleep these days because, you know, the book went off to press, and we already had some concerns about American democracy, and I think um, our concerns have been growing as this year has gone on. Um, and, you know, we find ourselves talking and, and we're thinking about the present through the lenses of the election of 1800, um, the conflict that was uh, brewing in, in what became known as bloody Kansas in the 1850s, leading up to the Civil War, um, and in North Carolina of 1898. So, uh, so we're somewhat what plagued by um, now what we've been learning about history. We started out um, a few years ago talking to each other about, is American democracy really in danger, you know, in some fundamental ways? Um, I think, you know, political scientists are always concerned about the health of democracy and lots of scholars of American politics for the past couple of decades have been writing about um, danger to democracy from government not being sufficiently responsive to um, citizens' views about what public policies they would like to see adopted and that kind of thing. But a few years ago, we began to worry about more fundamental things. Um, and uh, we almost felt like we didn't have the language for how to think about this. And, you know, from the outset, it seemed to us that most people around us were saying, well, of course, the United States is fine. Democracy is not fundamentally in danger. We have the world's oldest constitution. The country's been through a lot. And uh, while uh, the founding and, and the early period were very anti-democratic in some ways, that the country has enjoyed um, democratic development, democratization over time. And it came um, not easily through this long, slow development, but that we've seen real progress and we've reached a point where the United States is, um, is really quite democratic. And so we're not gonna be sliding backwards from that. But Rob and I were really curious about earlier periods in time when Americans uh, were very concerned that democracy as it had been developed up until that point 
was in danger of sliding backwards, of backsliding or deterioration rather than becoming more robust. And so in seeking a language for how to think about this, we started learning from our comparativist colleagues, those who study the rise and decline of democracies around the world. And we learned from them that there are four known threats to democracy. So the first is political polarization, high and rising polarization, where uh, politics and society become organized as us versus them. And um, at least one of the, of the two sides is fighting a battle that they think of as necessary to fight at all costs, never mind the cost to democracy. The second threat is called conflict over who belongs, who's a member of the political community, what is the status of people in different groups. And often these conflicts are over race or gender, ethnicity, and they're particularly, they can become particularly pernicious when they go back to some formative rift in the founding of the country and a group that's excluded. So what we've found is that in the United States, the status of African Americans has been um, a, a source of conflict over who belongs time and again. And then uh, economic inequality, when it is high and rising, can endanger uh, democracy. And the reason why is not that the 99% rise up and have a revolution. Rather, it's that the most affluent um, and powerful industries try to lock down their power because they are afraid that, um, you know, according to the majority rules of democracy, that they stand to lose a lot if lower and middle classes uh, gain more political power and uh, institute higher taxes and a more generous welfare state and so on. And then finally, the fourth threat is executive aggrandizement, meaning the concentration of power in the top political leader. Uh, and in the United States, the presidency has become more powerful um, since the 1930s, and both parties have contributed to that. Uh, presidents of either party have left the powers in the White House more extensive than they found them for the next um, inhabitant. So what we find when we look back through earlier periods in American history is that in fact, American democracy has been fragile time and again. These threats um, have emerged and, um, and made the system vulnerable. Um, when even one threat was present, as was the case in the 1790s, it was almost the undoing of the nation. We um, were on the, on the verge of having civil war, secession, and after just a, a decade um, in place, the nation could have come to a hasty end. When three threats converged in the 1850s, it led to the civil war. And when three threats converged in the 1890s, it led to the disenfranchisement of millions of African-American men, and that lasted for the next 60 years. Today, for the first time in American history, we have the convergence of all four threats at once. So we think that this is um, a dangerous situation. Um, it doesn't mean that we are destined for democracy to die, but it does mean that it's a time um, to be vigilant. Now I'll turn it over to Rob. Thanks, Suzanne. And let me add my thanks to Lee and uh, New America and Dee Dee and Megan for um, uh, sharing in this conversation. Um, so as Suzanne said, uh, what's um, really alarming uh, right now is this convergence of four threats um, and the challenges that that poses for democracy. When we talk about democracy in the book, what we mean is a system of representative government that promotes accountability between citizens and, um, and office holders. Um, and there are four things, four pillars of democracy that make this kind of system work. And we can track over time the ways in which these threats in various combinations have um, harmed or challenged these pillars. Uh, and very quickly, the four pillars of democracy are free and fair elections, um, the ability to hold elections that are, uh, are, are decisive um, and that, are, that have broad voting rights, um, the rule of law, the idea that law applies equally to everybody and that being in office or holding power does not allow one to evade the law. Um, the idea of a legitimate opposition, the idea that if you and I disagree about something, um, that we can be antagonists or opponents in a political argument, 
um, but that we don't become enemies whose goal is to vanquish one another. Um, and finally, what we call the integrity of rights, the protection, the widespread protection of the rights that are fundamentally necessary to make uh, democracy work, particularly civil liberties, civil rights, and voting rights. And for each of these pillars, we can identify, and we identify in the book, his ways in which these pillars of democracy were harmed in the various historical periods that we, uh, that we look at. Um, so for example, free and fair elections um, came under threat repeatedly in the 1850s in Kansas, um, when repeated elections were marked by fraud and violence. Um, in the 1890s, when um, elections um, were again marred by violence, and in one instance that we describe in some detail uh, in the book, um, followed by essentially a coup d'etat in the city of Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, in which a legitimately elected city government was, um, was overthrown by, uh, force, by, by the force of arms by white supremacists. Um, and then even again in the 1970s in the Watergate episode, which is another one of our periods where uh, President Nixon was able to use the power of the presidency and the tools of presidential power um, to uh, undermine the integrity of, of, or to try to undermine the integrity of the elections. The rule of law similarly has come under threat um, in a number of these periods. Um, in the 1850s and the 1890s again, um, in the run up to the Civil War, um, and, in, uh, and in the uh, disenfranchisement of African Americans in the 1890s, beginning in the 1890s at the end of Reconstruction, um, and, and the violent overthrow of, of legitimately elected governments. Um, repeatedly, the, leg the idea of legitimate opposition um, waxes and wanes. So in the 1790s, uh, as the, the, the same founders, the same men who wrote the constitution and created the system of government uh, stepped into offices under the constitution. Um, they divided into teams um, who had very different visions of what the future of the country should be and what kinds of policies the national government should pursue. Um, and those teams immediately set on each other, um, not just as political opponents, but they saw the other, each saw the other side as a uh, mortal threat to the future of the country. Um, and they proceeded to attack each other um, uh, in, the, in that way through uh, the media, newspaper wars, and, and, other, and even legislative means such as the Alien and Sedition Acts. And finally, the integrity of rights. Um, clearly, uh, the right, civil rights, voting rights have not moved in a, in a, in a uh, uniformly forward direction over time but they've gone back and forth. And the best example of that in our historical cases, again, is the um, disenfranchisement of several million African-American men at the end of Reconstruction. Today, with the confluence of all four threats, which is happening really for the first time, as Suzanne said, uh, in American history, um, again, all four of these pillars of democracy are under assault. Um, we hardly need to uh, outline all of this to anyone who has been paying attention. Um, but uh, just to run through them quickly, clearly um, free and fair elections are under the most immediate threat um, that I think probably most of us can uh, recall in our lifetimes. Um, uh, we're all worried about how the 2020 presidential election is going to play out given voter suppression uh, um, uh, uh, efforts that seem to be um, underway given um, the attacks on the Postal Service and the idea of uh, mail-in ballots in the middle of a pandemic, um, and given uh, systematic, what seem like systematic efforts to um, undermine the legitimacy of the election even in advance. Um, the rule of law has been um, under assault for uh, years, certainly in the Trump presidency, um, um, with the president's brazen attempts, um, mostly successful to evade the law. Um, the idea of a legitimate opposition, um, the idea that Democrats and Republicans um, might have different ideas or different views, um, but are uh, sort of share the same stage and the same platform and the same ultimate goals, um, that idea seems to have, which, which was a sort of familiar way of conducting American politics for a long time, it seemed, in the middle of the 20th century, um, that seems to have completely uh, disappeared. Um, 
um, and the I, the you and you see uh, each side trying to press for partisan advantage, even if it means uh, uh, trampling over democratic process and democratic procedures. You see arguments about this playing out right now with the fight over uh, replacing Justice Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Um, and finally, the integrity of rights clearly under attack. Um, voting rights for a number of years have been uh, challenged in the United States. So um, a quick glance at the contemporary scene uh, um, underscores our, our fears and our conclusion um, that uh, democracy in the presence of these four threats is really under serious challenge today. Uh, and I think we need to take that threat uh, very seriously. So let's uh, expand the conversation uh, to our uh, discussions here. I want to start with Didi. Great. Well, first of all, congratulations to Rob and Suzanne for this fantastic book. It was a pleasure to read, and it was instructive to remember that American history has been beset by existential crises in the past and that we've gotten through them. It was also useful to note that these compromises often sacrificed some other values, whether it was liberal values, racial equity, rule of law, et cetera. Um, so Suzanne notes that the identification of the four threats draws on comparative literature. And ultimately, Rob and Suzanne conclude that the confluence of the four crises doesn't bode well for democracy. And I just wanted to first note that this is part of a global trend that I think deserves a little more attention. Um, in a recent report on global populisms that we released at Stanford, we examined the rise of populism throughout the West. Populism is an, a sort of thin ideology that says society is composed of two groups, first the pure people and the corrupt elite, and that politics should express the general will broadly construed of the people. So the danger of populism today, it's contemporary manifestation is that it brings a coherence to the four threats that Rob and Suzanne outline of polarization, inequality, executive aggrandizement, and uh, inclusion or belonging, because it provides an explanation for some of them, i.e. it says we are unequal and we have questions about identity because the elites are conspiring against the people. And then it uses this as a pretext to engage in some of the other threats, i.e. polarizing the electorate even further and dismantling the formal institutions of democracy through executive aggrandizement. The danger here is that since the Cold War ended, we have no serious threat to democracy in the form of authoritarianism, the way the 1930s, the chapter on the 1930s, and you had you know, real bread and butter fascists in the United States. We don't necessarily have that today, but we instead have a coherent, little d democratic worldview among populists that you can use democratic institutions to achieve a liberal outcomes. Um, and empirically in the past 10 years or so, the erosion of democratic institutions has often been either sanctioned or unnoticed by the public at large. It often happens sort of behind closed door among elite uh, politics and politicians. <clears throat> so in polarized environments in particular, people have become more likely to say that they're fine with manipulating the rules in order for their parties to win. So I won't go into a lot of detail about the rise of the far right, but suffice it to say the far right is a powerful force that has emerged across the West in Western Europe and in the United States. And there's now a template for using uh, illiberal means uh, along the lines that Rob just spelled out. And this template capitalizes on grievance politics of those left behind by globalization as well as identity politics and is a sort of nationalist and racist response to increasing levels of diversity and integration. So without a full-throated defense of democracy per se, in a, the form of a political settlement that Rob and Suzanne outline in the conclusion, this seems increasingly unlikely given the retreat of the liberal international order um, and any number of rising authoritarian threats geopolitically. So you're likely to continue to see leaders come to power with loose democratic commitments. So Four Threats, the book, argues that political settlements should not sacrifice some liberal values for others, but I'm curious about what kind of positive protections these political settlements can offer and how they might be used to strengthen and support a new era of democracy globally in the near future. Lee, do you want us to respond? Yeah, Lee. Oh, oh yeah. yes, yeah. yes, 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 absolutely, yes. Okay. I think you should absolutely respond. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, first of all, thanks, Didi, for those really penetrating comments. And I think appreciating the setting of the United States in comparative context is um, that's one of the things that we hope to accomplish um, in the book. And we've learned an enormous amount from, um, from Didi and others, um, especially our colleagues, Suzanne's colleagues at Cornell, uh, Ken Roberts and Tom Papinski, um, amazing comparative uh, uh, comparative scholars um, about the ways in which these trends that have challenged democracy elsewhere in the country are um, are uh, are also threats in the United States. I mean, we we those of us in American politics um, have tended to sort of think about the United States as a sort of hermetically sealed case, um, and um, what do you know? It's actually subject to the same uh, political. Uh, forces that um, challenge other democracies. And, and the, our friends would say to us, you know, just alarming things, especially after the 2016 election, you know, like, um, yeah, you know, democracies come and go. We had a good run in the United States, you know, or, you know, start to catalog uh, for us all the other places um, in the world where legitimately elected democratic leaders had proceeded to hollow out democracy um, and move countries toward an non-democratic and illiberal sta status, you know, Turkey and Hungary and Venezuela and so on and so forth. Um, so those insights actually are really important to us and I think fueled a lot of what we tried to do in the book. Um, the, 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 we don't really take up the uh, populism as a concept in the, in the book, but there's a lot of affinity between populism that Didi describes around the world and this sort of tension in the book between the progress or lack of progress in democracy and the protection of liberal, a liberal society, since mo a lot of the, these democratic settlements revolve around um, you know, the promotion of illiberalism, particularly race, particularly regarding race, right? Race is really the vector for populism in the United States. And one of the things we note over and over again is the way, um, politicians, elite politicians, and especially politicians who represent wealthy interests are able to use racial uh, division and scare tactics in order to create a coalition. Um, that's a, a, an example of what happened in North Carolina in the 1890s, for example. Um, and so that's, that is, um, that's sort of the American flavor of this global challenge. Maybe I'll just um, add a little bit more quickly to this. Um, yeah, Didi, thank you so much for your comments. And um, you know, we just really appreciate being engaged in conversation with comparativists like yourself. Um, I think the the conversation um, among scholars of American politics is often so hermetically sealed from consideration of the rest of the world. We just, you know, we have had the luxury of studying only the United States and rarely thinking about it in comparative context. So I think that um, we tend to have the assumption that danger to democracy um, would mean something like there are tanks in the streets and the military takes over, or you know the president sends Congress, disbands Congress. And so it would be something really dramatic and we don't think that's about to happen. And so therefore, why are we having a conversation about danger to democracy? And what we've learned from the comparativists is that those kinds of um, dramatic, you know, in a moment kind of loss of democracy experiences um, are something associated more with the early mid 20th century, whereas the latter 20th century to the present, what's, what has become much more common is democratic deter deterioration or backsliding that happens more gradually, where some pillars of democracy may remain intact, but others may seriously erode. So you end up with a system that can be called competitive authoritarianism. For example, usually elections are still held. They may not be free and fair according to the criteria that we would think should be part of them, but um, there are still elections and yet the rule of law becomes hollowed out the integrity of rights is hollowed out and so on. So by thinking with those lenses, it, it helps us to then begin to think about the United States um, in a more nuanced way. 
And I think, you know, one of the things we're really trying to do in the book is to take this, this term of democracy, which we often um, don't define um, scholars of American politics. We treat it as kind of a warm and fuzzy idea that, you know, we're all supposed to be in favor of. What we're trying to do in the book is to think about, well, um, what does democracy actually mean and what are its features? And then how can we assess whether each of those is remaining intact and or becoming more robust or deteriorating? Um, and we do that, we try to do that in each of the different periods. Megan, I know you have a lot to say. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so uh, hello from Seattle, the West Coast, pretty early over here. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation today. Um, and I really wanna thank Rob and Suzanne for this incredible book. Um, and uh, as Lee said in his opening comments, a very timely book in a scary way. Um, it struck me as I, as I drove today to, to school where I'm actually at right now that things have actually gotten a lot worse um, right now than when you guys were actually writing the book perhaps in terms of um, kind of where we are in terms of threats to democracy. Um, in my opening uh, kind of comments, I want to pose two questions. Um, one about the 1890s, uh, a chapter in terms of backsliding of the 1890s, um, and then another comment question um, about the Black Lives Matter protests and race um, and Black citizenship today. So for the first, um, for those who have not read this book, hold on, let me pull this up here because I like a prop, um, please do get it um, and read it. Um, for me, I found the entire book really fascinating, but um, specifically the 1890s, because it strikes me that so much of what is happening now in terms of lessons um, about how to deconstruct in some ways democracy, um, as well as how to rebuild it, are actually in this period of the 1890s. It has everything, right? It has labor organizing. It has um, a height of Black political activism and then the end of that. Um, and so I guess my question about the 1890s, um, because I, I think that there is so much here and I plan to actually use this chapter in, in future courses, um, but what does this, the 1890s specifically, teach us about the importance of enforcement institutions um, to undermining um, democracy as well as to, um, uh, as well as to amplifying and or, and or to strengthening um, democracy? And I'm thinking here, I mean, in part, I've been thinking a lot in the past month about enforcement institutions um, to rights making in part because of a, actually a conversation that I had with Dorian Warren um, and thinking about knock on wood what might be possible in a Biden administration and how do we um, and how does the left perhaps actually protect um, some of the gains that are actually been had and it strikes me that in this 1890s period that one of the things um, um, that happens here is in terms of um, tearing down specific parts of the Enforcement Act of 1870 as being an important part to undermining and eroding democracy during this time. It also strikes me, you guys know, of course, some of my work, as well as colleagues of both of yours um, at Hopkins and Cornell work on prisons and policing. Um, and so I'm thinking here also about in terms of rights, especially the role of enforcement mechanisms around policing and prisons, and obviously in the contemporary environment around, around ICE um, and undermining democracy. Um, and thinking as well, as we come out of the 60s, of course, um, what are different types of enforcement mechanisms, such as those around um, workplace discrimination um, and, and different types of uh, enforcement mechanisms um, that have actually kind of, that have actually protected democracy. So again, this question is just about um, the role of enforcement mechanisms um, and how you're thinking about democracy. Um, secondly, um, I want to, I've been kind of trying to put and, and, and um, putting your book and the argument of your book in conversation um, and thinking about the Black Lives Matter protests um, of the spring and summer of, of this year. And so just a kind of a comment and then a larger question about citizenship here. Um, and so we know that, of course, uh, Black people have historically used protests in both its nonviolent and violent forms as a means of emphasizing the nation's failures and demanding, demanding that the state honor its constitutional and political promises. In this respect, in so many ways, George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor's murder in particular has become a call for racial justice movements because they so clearly highlight the compounding ways the state has harmed its own citizens, 
a system of predatory capitalism that has left millions unemployed and underemployed and a criminal punishment system that kills with impunity and the abandonment of public institutions, public officials, and public policies, um, a trifecta of American democracy that have repeatedly failed to better the lives of black communities. Violent policing was, of course, part of the kindling, but an entrenched system of institutional racism and executive disregard fanned the flames of the fire. Um, so I kept thinking about the challenges that this poses in terms of your, the argument of the book, as well as the present moment for Black people. Um, the challenges in so many ways, um, for me at least, as being a scholar um, of Black politics and the Black political experience, there's a lot of takeaways, of course, from this book. But it seems that one of these takeaways um, kind of addresses the question that has always been at the crux, I feel like, of the Black political experience, which is reform or transformation. And in these five political moments through these four threats, and I'm coming out of this and I can make, I can, I, can, I can write a report or write a paper about how this book in so many ways proves the need for political transformation, that reform is not enough, that in so many ways that if, if, if I believe Melvin Rogers, who argues that black people are perpetual losers in American democracy, and if I believe Juliet Hooker, who argues that there are fundamental, fundamental limits of liberal democracy's ability as an institution to deal with certain types of injustice, um, that in terms of what, what possibilities are possible within this system, and kind of the question that I feel like has been a lot of our minds in terms of this summer is, can Black lives matter inside of US democracy? And it seems that a lot of people are coming out, especially some of us have already been there, but it seems like a lot of people are coming out of the summer with that, like, no, that the Constitution needs to be rewritten, that, that institutions that have been in place, that there's, that there's progress that can be made, but that's always limited. And it always, there's always a type of pushback. Um, so I, I guess in terms of kind of this question of, of, about what does, I guess, in terms of what types of deep, deep structural reforms are necessary um, to address um, the deep denials of citizenship rights that Black people have endured in this country. Um, and then just relatedly also, I know I posed more than two questions here, um, is this perhaps the moment for what some have called the third reconstruction? Um, that unlike the first reconstruction and unlike the second reconstruction, that perhaps at least protesters demand for what for what they want and what is possible is more expansive um, than ever before. So I guess I will end there. More and more than specific questions, I guess it's like meditations and end her thoughts. Okay, I'll, I'll start out here. Thank you so much, Megan. These are fabulous comments and are gonna give us a lot of food for thought that which we can probably only begin to, to ruminate now. Um, I'm really glad you're focusing in on the 1890s because we also um, find that the story of the 1890s to have a lot of similarities to today. So three threats were present then. Polarizers um, in the South, um, use conflict over who belongs. Specifically, they use white supremacy um, as, a, as a strategy to, for their political ends. So, which isn't to say that, you know, they weren't white supremacists, they certainly were, but they were also using it very strategically. Um, and these are democratic leaders in the South um, who were, you know, tended to be a lot of the, the business elites and the, the leaders in society. Uh, white leaders, um, they were using it to try to get um, whites who had strayed, lower and middle income whites who were veering off toward the populist party to come back into the fold and to um, give them the chance to once again become the dominant party. And what these Democrats in the 1890s in the South did not want was to have to compete. They didn't like having to compete. I mean, frankly, you know, they managed to, um, you know, they had been advantaged for a long time by the Three-Fifths Compromise. This is gone after the Civil War. Then in, um, even after Reconstruction ends, um, there are, there really is the beginnings of a healthier democracy um, nationwide, including in the South, and African Americans are continuing in many states to really um, run for office um, at pretty high rates and to vote at pretty high rates. And uh, at that point, the, um, the white Democrats decided we've had enough of this. We need to shut this down. 
um, enough with having political opposition. And so they stage a coup in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and we tell the whole story of this in, in the book. And then if, and, and in this coup, they kill um, hundreds of African Americans in the city that was really a, a symbol of a you know rising black middle class and where um, African Americans were in all sorts of elected positions and city government. They um, at gunpoint made those people resign from office. They um, they drove people out of town who were the leaders, um, and then in the months that followed, they instituted in the state of North Carolina poll taxes and literacy tests. Um, disenfranchising African Americans. And we focus in on this story in North Carolina because it brings out into the open the dynamics that happen more quietly in states all over the South. Um, and so the whole region um, becomes disenfranchised, uh, African Americans become disenfranchised, and once people have lost political power, then in turn they lose civil liberties and civil rights, and it lasts for 60 years. So this is the, um, the settlement that comes out of this period of 1890s. It's a settlement that restores racial hierarchy in the South. And, you know, in terms of enforcement mechanisms, it's, um, there is such a, a lack of them. You know, there'd been the effort, I mean, earlier Republicans in the North had been trying to stand up for the voting rights of Blacks in the South. But they were, by the early 1890s, um, the party was becoming more divided over that and, and really was focusing on other things. And so they missed an opportunity to really strengthen their, their power to do that. And then by the time you get to the Wilmington coup, President McKinley, Republican president, African Americans in Wilmington um, appeal to him for help. There are pleas for help. And he ignores them entirely. Um, and, uh, and then as you know, all of these states are setting up disenfranchisement laws, um, you have President Theodore Roosevelt simply looks the other way. And then uh, Taft, he really sanctions it and says, well, there's an element of the population that really shouldn't be voting. Um, and so even the, op the seeming opposition party doesn't stand up to uh, the Democrats at that point in time. Um, and so, there's really a lack of enforcement mechanisms. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, uh, you know, that, that makes it, it really difficult. And the consequences of backsliding at that point are egregious and long lasting. Um, I'll, just, I'll just add, first of all, thanks for those uh, tremendously provocative and interesting comments, um, uh, Megan. Um, I think, um, I think one of the things that we, I guess we could say learn, I think we already knew this, but one of the things that becomes really apparent when you line up these episodes together is that um, race and conflict over belonging and the boundaries of citizenship and the boundaries of membership in the political community is really a constant force in American politics, even when, even in the periods where we don't, you know, market as being central, right? Um, you know, where politics isn't, um, where, po where, where it doesn't necessarily overlap with partisan divisions or polarization. So in the 1790s, for example, um, there was no, you know, there were, there were these two partisan groupings, the Federalists and the, and the Democratic Republicans. There was no disagreement across the board between Federalists and Republicans about slavery or the status of of slavery or of enslaved people in the country, right? But still, the resolution of the crisis over the 1800 election depended on the three-fifths compromise, which gave disproportionate extra power to the white slaveholding South vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country, right? If there were no three-fifths compromise, Adams would have won re-election and the whole Jefferson Burr conflict that we know about from the musical would never have happened, right? So, um, so and, and then that um, disproportionate power of the South really sets off, as, as, um, as Suzanne just said, um, um, a chain of events through the entire 19th century that affects um, the way the country develops, the way the party system develops, and the run-up to the Civil War and Reconstruction. So, um, 
that so we we kind of liken that conflict, that tension in American democracy to a sort of underground reservoir that can be tapped and is tapped frequently and from time to time, but not always by by strategic political leaders for whom it's useful, right? Whether it's in the conflict over slavery or in the conflict in the 1890s, as Suzanne um, just described. Um, I'm also really glad, Megan, that you mentioned the first and second reconstructions, because we often felt that as we were writing the book, we felt that, you know, this is a, what, a 250 page book. We felt like there was a thousand page book trying to get out, um, you know, where we would have dealt not only with these episodes of democratic challenge, but of these two, really, these are the two great democratizing moments in American history, the first and second reconstructions, right? Um, so there's another side to the coin that we, that we didn't uh, uh, write about. Um, but I think they're I think they're instructive because you see the sort of dialectic push and pull of movements to democratize, um, and then these forces which push back on democratization. Um, I think your question about um, you know structural reforms and a third reconstruction is it's not something we really have an answer to. I mean I think structural reforms um, are really hard. You know we know that features of the constitutional order like the electoral college and equal representation in the Senate um, bias the system in a lot of ways that we're seeing that we're, we're reaping the benefits or detriments of that right now, right? Um, I think uh, it's really unrealistic to think right now about, you know, amending the constitution to get rid of the electoral college, for example. Um, um, so I think, um, um, which isn't to say that we don't need a thoroughgoing transformation of the democratic order. Um, I, it's just hard to see how you achieve that. I think the focus has to be on these features of democracy that we've pointed to, right? We can observe, we can see free and fair elections being undermined. We can see the rule of law being undermined. We can see um, um, rights being taken away. Um, and I think that's where our attention has to, has to be focused. Um, because one of the things we know from history is that turning back polarization um, and these are the, the threats at a sort of macro level is just really hard. Um, just one last quick thought about the Black Lives Matter movement or the resurgence of that movement this spring and summer. Um, you know, if there's, if there's anything that gives me maybe a little ray of hope, which I think we're all desperately looking for just, you know, even this week. Um, it's the extent and depth and, and breadth of the way that movement has unfolded over the summer. Um, you know, it's happening, marches and, and protests and actions are happening. And you know this, you, you know, you can educate us on this better than anyone, Megan. Um, you know, in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect, <clears throat> excuse me, involving people that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And, you know, does this mean maybe that we are ready for a third reckoning with this sort of, you know, founding flaw in, in the country? Maybe. I mean, I think there's a lot of conflict and a lot of politics and a lot of back and forth and who knows what between here and there. But I think, is there an opening now for a different kind of conversation about some of these issues that you brought up? I, we can hope so. Keep the conversation going. Didi, I know you have a bunch of thoughts about the role of political parties in both sustaining and maybe not sustaining democracy. Yeah, I, um, first of all, I have loved the conversation so far, Megan. Those were really wonderful comments. And I, I this is sort of a follow on to, to Megan's question. Um, I'm curious about the role of just the public in some of the stories and episodes that you describe. Um, their, and, and their role, especially in resolving some of the crises of democracy. We know not only through the story of the United States, but all other democratic countries that democratic reforms and progress are typically initiated and sustained by citizens, not just by elites who are like, yes, I'll happily redistribute political power now. Um, so outside of crises, I'm wondering what it is that sustains democracy, sort of in the, in the down times and how well can citizens actually get what they want from their governments without protesting today? 
2019 was a year of protest around the globe. Erica Chenoweth says that nonviolent mass movements are the primary challenges to governments today. Citizens basically have no recourse or, or little recourse through the ballot box and through sort of typical politics. And in fact, protests have increased as turnout across the world has declined, I guess with 2018 being sort of an exception in the United States. These protests have different proximate causes, but many of them are born of discontent with the poor performance of democracy. Sometimes it was the corruption scandal at the national level. Sometimes it's the lifting of subsidies, food subsidies, oil subsidies. Sometimes it's austerity politics, like cutting social benefits. This summer, there have been massive protests about fraudulent or delayed elections, and also about COVID responses by governments. But I think what they reveal is that the intermediary linkages between citizens and governments have really broken down since the rise of sort of the neoliberal era or the end of the Cold War, when there was this consensus that democracy and capitalism are good. So then not much is done to nurture democracy. Um, we know that parties from the book are more, preference, are more responsive to the preferences of the wealthy, but there's also new research about the hollowness um, and the weakness of mainstream parties in general, that over the past 30 or 40 years, they no longer serve the integrative functions that they used to. You rarely find local and state parties these days. Um, and they have privileged, parties have privileged governing responsibly, i.e. through generating economic growth or through technocratic decision making, rather than um, governing responsively. So in other words, responsibility over management of things like the economy has taken uh, precedence over being responsive to the demands of citizens. And this is something that Suzanne also mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So my question is, does rebuilding democracy, I, I see that you know structural change is maybe not possible, although that's something that I think would be fascinating to talk about for the remaining time. But does rebuilding democracy if it doesn't involve institutional reform, which, I, which it might, and maybe liberal democracy is very limited in the ways that Megan discussed, but does it at least involve repairing intermediary linkages between citizens and leaders? And how do you do that? We know that on Friday night, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, Act Blue raised $100 million. Is that right? It was double their best day ever. And is this the way we have to participate with parties now, just writing checks? Like, there has to be more to democracy than that. And I'm wondering what you think. Great, thank you. It's it's a great question, and it's it's you know it's it's not a question that we really address head on in the book. So uh, you know I'm I'm going to be kind of um, reflecting on it now in light of you know the kind of patterns in the book. Um, I you know I'm inclined to say it is true that the hollowing out of political parties has been really problematic, and that um, I think comes to a surprise as most people to most people because you know we hear about Partisan, um, partisan polarization. Um, and, you know, so parties are strong at some level. Well, they're strong in Congress among leaders, there's strong partisanship. And then individuals have a strong sense of partisanship. But parties as organizations um, that have members at the grassroots level that participate and have a, a, that kind of linkage you're describing um, have become really weak. Um, and uh, And then there have been you know some some replacements for them, um, and here I'm I'm drawing on work by people like Alex Hurdle Fernandez um, and Theda Scotchpole, um, looking at the um, Americans for Prosperity and the Koch brothers groups, etc., which actually um, seem to be very organized and to you know raise a lot of money and have kind of taken the place of the Republican Party in many ways. Um, the Republican Party. Um, has also been advantaged, and I mean, I think, you know, both Didi and, and Megan, you probably have a lot to say about this and know a lot about this, so, so feel free to, to jump in on it. Um, but have been, um, the Republican Party has been advantaged by active groups among its constituencies. So um, by gun groups, gun owners groups um, that are very organized at the local level and then really brought together through the NRA, through evangelical churches and their pro-life bent um, and, um, and other organizations. Whereas uh, Democrats that used to be very strong through labor unions, that's become much weaker. And there's not really something replacing that. So for the Democratic Party, um, you know, there's been great losses over time. And um, I think that, 
you know, it's very sobering when you, for Democrats, I think, if you look at uh, the political map over time, over the past couple of decades, many states that used to routinely elect um, plenty of Democrats don't anymore. Um, states like um, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, Louisiana, et cetera, um, sending, you know, Democrats to Congress and, and being um, swing states in the Electoral College, that's long gone. And um, so I, I think that um, for Democrats, it's important to, you know, think about why that is. And I think, you know, as you say, um, Dee Dee, rising frustration among Americans. I mean, we know that if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, when people were asked these classic questions on surveys about, do you trust the federal government in Washington to do what is right most or all of the time? Um, two thirds or three quarters of Americans would say yes. Um, it's now at about one in five. Um, it, when people were asked questions about, do you think public officials care about people like you? Again, it was the vast majority of Americans who would say yes, now it's about one in five. So, I mean, there, there's, um, and this has been a vibe, uh, something that cuts across Democrats and Republicans has been declining confidence in government, though particularly on the Republican side. And I think that helped to fuel Trump's rise in 2016 among people who felt um, very alienated from government and felt that it really wasn't there for them. Um, and then I think it, it you know, makes it increasingly difficult for us to engage in collective action um, and, uh, and, and for people to, to figure out a way forward. Let me just add a few thoughts to, to all of what Suzanne just said. Um, I think uh, um, another feature of contemporary polarization um, is the real, you know, division of not just uh, uh, elites, political leaders, elected officials, but the, the general public into this sort of us versus them, non-overlapping camps or teams. Um, you know, we, when, 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 at least when Suzanne and I were in graduate school, you guys are younger than, than we are, so I don't know what you got taught, but, but you know, we used to, th we used to think about, um, um, the American public in particular as characterized by what, what political scientists would call cross-cutting cleavages. That is, you would be, people are members of different groups um, that don't necessarily overlap with each other. So your professional group, the people you work with, the people you live with or go to church with or socialize with or pursue your hobbies with are, are all different kinds of people. Um, those increasingly, we're, we find that those kinds of groupings among the public have collapsed on, on, into a single dimension so that the people, you, um, the people you go to school with and work with and live near and so on and so forth um, are likely to be other people who are just like you and share your orientation and your beliefs. Um, and as one little piece of evidence of, that, of this that we cite in the book, um, there has been a survey question asked periodically, but infrequently over time in public opinion surveys um, about, you know, would you be upset if your son or daughter um, married a person from the opposite political party, right? The way like my grandmother would worry about marrying outside the faith, right? Um, um, you know, and in the 60s, most people didn't care, right? Um, but when that question was repeated just a few years ago, a majority of people said, yes, I would be upset if my son or daughter brought home someone of the opposite political party. So partisanship has become part of our social identity rather than just a sort of sum total of our attitudes and affiliations. Um, and, and, that, and, then, and then partisan competition becomes this sort of um, sport between teams, as, as Francis Lee, the political scientist, describes it. And this teamsmanship um, drives parties to try and win at all costs. Um, and whether, whether or not they observe democratic uh, rules or norms. Um, and that, that sort of fuels this kind of dynamic. So, um, yeah, the parties have been hollowed out as organizations, but Americans have also sorted themselves into these groupings that make that kind of competition more likely and more pernicious. Um, on top of that, um, I think um, the role of the, the, the 
balance between the president and the Congress comes into play here because increasingly, you know, polarization creates gridlock. Gridlock means frustration for people on either side of the political spectrum. Um, and presidents find themselves stymied because Congress won't do anything. Presidents are increasingly, um, um, this goes back to Dee's point about populism. Presidents are increasingly sort of frustrated in their ability to pursue their programs and keep their promises and are, are tempted and encouraged to try unilateral ways of governing, right? So the growth of presidential power on top of polarization creates this very dangerous situation that leads to this kind of populist um, uh, cascade that Didi was describing a few minutes ago. So there are a whole bunch of things, and this this it really is is our, one of our core points is that it's the layering on top of each other of these threats, you know, along with these other trends that you guys have both have both pointed out that 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 really leads to um, what we see as a as a dangerous situation. Megan, I know you have some more thoughts and questions. Yeah, no, this is. This is great. Um, I'm going to try to be quick because I have some other ones too, if there's extra time. Um, but you guys know a, a lot of what I often think about um, is around political, American political development. It's not just in terms of a kind of top down, but also bottom up, right? And so wanting to think about how the American state is constructed um, through contestation in terms of citizens who are oftentimes at the margins of society um, and how citizens on the ground can contest and then perhaps shift institutional structures um, and in some so many ways driven by a belief that is precisely during these unsettled moments when institutions are not responding to the demands of citizens which can provide an opening for bottom-up protests to disrupt and reshape top-down structures um, and so i guess my question here is one about um, the role of social movements in particular in the transitionary or the in-between moments um, in between these five moments that you focus on, right? And so for me, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of, and I know this is a question that I'll get from students when I assign this, which is how do we spin out um, of these, of these, of these uh, moments? Um, what leads to the waning of these, of these moments? Um, 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 and how do we like move out of them? Is, there, is it that organized people on the ground um, lead to us spinning out of these different moments? Um, and in part, obviously, here I'm thinking about if, if it is true, and I believe that it is, <laughs> that we right now in this contemporary moment have a confluence of, four, of the four threats, um, I'm trying to think about how do we get out of them, um, what is the role of social movement um, for kind of getting out of the present circumstance. At the same time, and this is, this is just kind of an asterisk addendum, I am also persuaded, right, uh, by Theta, by uh, uh, my colleague Chris Parker, by Sotero, um, ha who argue that in a lot of ways the Republican Party has become a movement party. Um, so it, it's, I obviously, my work is focused on one type of social movement, right? And this is like the Black uh, freedom struggle. Um, I am fully aware that social movements also um, exist on the other side. So I guess I'm just curious. Um, about how you conceive of social movements um, in your work and in amplifying and or undermining democracy. Okay, I'll start. Um, the answer is we'll be waiting for you to write the book on this. <laughs> um, no, I, I think we don't have, coming out of our book, we don't really have a systematic way of thinking about social movements. And I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, if we look across all of the periods we discuss, there's a lot of movement activity in these periods. And, um, and some of it is progressive and some of it is, is not. Some of it is, um, the movements of people who worry that their heritage and their way of life is being taken away. Um, and, you know, that was, um, you know, certainly there was plenty of that in the 1850s and uh, there was uh, lots of that in the 1890s. Um, and, you know, some of it really mobilized by political elites, you know, in, in Wilmington, the Democrats, helped to organize these paramilitary 
groups of white supremacists. Um, so, um, so I'm I'm not um, I'm not sure about you know what to say um, about the relationship between either democratic backsliding or democratization in these specific periods. Um, uh, and uh, certainly political leaders would point to the social movements they didn't like and say they were dangerous to democracy. And you know that begins with none other than George Washington. I mean, it's, it's amazing how um, George Washington really saw anyone who was being critical of the policies of his government as being an insurrectionist. So he viewed the Whiskey Rebellion this way, and he himself led troops, led 15,000 troops gathered from four states, the militias of four states, into Western Pennsylvania to try to put down this insurrection of the Whiskey Rebels, these you know poor farmers who were upset that they had to pay this tax on distilled spirits as part of Hamilton's financial plan. And you know, it, it was, I, I kept thinking of it this summer when events were going on in Portland because um, in Pennsylvania, the local officials were all opposed to the federal government sending troops. They kept saying this, the governor was saying it, the local members of Congress were saying it, do not send troops, do not overreact, that would be overreach. Um, but Hamilton is convinced it's the thing to do um, and, uh, and ultimately gets Washington to go along with that. They get to the site of the whiskey, rebellion and the rebels have already fled into the frontier. They're not there anymore. The leaders are gone. Just they, they round up a few people. They don't have much evidence against them. And um, ultimately they arrest two people and finally Washington pardons them. But um, you know, that was just the beginning of in the 1790s, a lot of um, ways in which the Federalists tried to repress um, dissent of any kind, including from like the new democratic Republican societies that were forming. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I guess I would love to hear your reflections, Megan, on if you see some patterns or, you know, a broader um, kind of a framework that you might see making sense across these periods. And you probably don't have an answer for that now, but um, down the line, it would be great to hear that. Rob, do you want to talk? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm waiting for Megan's book to um, pick up where we leave off. Um, no, but I think, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think if we had, if, if we had written a thousand page book and thought about the flip side, the democratizing movements, the two reconstructions alongside these episodes of democratic threat, we might have a clearer and more coherent analytical story about social movements. Um, um, so I, I would like to think more about that and have a maybe longer, different conversation about that. But I, the, the other thing I want to just mention is, um, you know, Suzanne just described the, the government's response to the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, this is a pattern that we notice throughout our, our, um, our periods, is the government reacting to this kind of movement activity um, that they regarded as a challenge with violent repression, right? This is not just um, social movements as a sort of adjunct to other kinds of liberal democratic political participation, right? Um, so we opened the 1930s chapter with a story of the Bonus Army, these poor bedraggled World War I veterans who come to Washington in 1932. Um, asking that the government advance a payment of a pension that was supposed to be paid to them sometime in the 1940s. And they said, we're jobless and hungry now. We need the money now. Why should we have to wait until 1945? Um, and they protested peacefully and they set up these uh, sort of camps around the city and were eventually cleared out by the army. Douglas MacArthur and Dwight Eisenhower and George Patton led the army against these poor um, uh, jobless uh, veterans in the, in the, in the capital. Um, a couple were killed by, a couple of the veterans were killed by the, not by the army, but by the DC police. Uh, so, um, you know, you see the, the Kent State, the massacre of Kent students at, protesting students at Kent State in 1970 um, during the Vietnam War protests. So this pattern of democratizing movements of one kind or another being met with violent resistance is, is 
um, it's there as soon as you think about it, but I don't think it's what we expected to find when we set out to write the book. Um, but it is, it is a disturbing pattern, and I think one that we have to take seriously. So I, I want to move the conversation a little bit forward and, and current thinking, and I really would love to get everybody to, to weigh in on, uh, I think what I'll try to, try to bring together some, some of the questions we've been hearing and some of my own uh, questions here. You know, so we're, we're in this incredibly volatile, intense moment uh, leading up to the election. And you know, so part one of this question is, is, what do you all think the next few months are, are going to look like? Uh, and you know, the, the, the follow on question is, and then what? Uh, you know, we are seeing a tremendous call uh, among Democratic activists that Democrats, if they should get the trifecta in 2021, that they should use that power to, you know, add DC, maybe some others as a state, uh, maybe add justices to the Supreme Court, which they would say would, would be necessary to protect voting rights and, you know, and, and, and protect protect against minority rule, uh, or, and, and others are saying, well, that's just going to escalate things further. And, you know, so what do you all think informed by your historical understanding uh, of American politics? You, uh, you should, let's start with, uh, with Robert and, and Suzanne and then move on to Didi and Megan. Oh, well, um, well, what are the next few months uh, look like? I mean, I think that's that's incredibly worrisome, and it seems to be getting more worrisome by the almost by the hour. Um, you know, I think that can we have a are we are we are we going to have a free and fair election in the United States in six weeks? Yeah, I mean, I think the path to that is very narrow and very precarious, right? Um, and we've all heard and we can spin plenty of very, very likely nightmare scenarios about what election night and the weeks after election night um, look like. Um, so I think that's very worrisome that we end up with a very, you know, a, 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 an election of questionable legitimacy in which the president will use his I won't say authority, but his power and the tools at his disposal to gum up the works, to fuzz up the, the clarity of election results, um, and to cheat his way to a second term, right? I think there are a lot of ways that can happen. Um, I think that's incredibly worrisome. Um, and if that happens, you know, I don't think we have a script for what happens after that. Um, you know, then are we on the road to one of these competitive authoritarian regimes that's Suzanne alluded to earlier, Turkey or Hungary or something like that, you know, then I think the movement question becomes really serious, right? Um, and how we can convert the, the, the bottom up politics um, that has bubbled in the last six months into something that's really going to restore uh, 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 democracy in the United States. I think that becomes then a serious question. I think the, 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 um, you know, if, if that nightmare scenario or one version of that nightmare scenario doesn't come to pass, you know, and let's say Biden wins the election and uh, the Democrats um, um, retain control of the House and take control of the Senate, you know, then I think it's a real question. What should the Democrats do? Um, you know, they have this moment when they could actually um, really reform things in some pretty significant ways that we just mentioned. Add seats to the court, um, create a couple new states that are going to be reliable democratic uh, uh, states, you know, Puerto Rico and, and Washington, D.C. Um, but that leads to a question that's always sort of bedevil democratic advocates, and that is when an anti-democratic party, and I think, you know, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt have argued pretty persuasively that the Republicans have become an anti-democratic party. 
Um, when an anti-democratic party takes these actions and plays, as they call it, constitutional hardball, what does the pro-democratic opponent do? Do, 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 we, do they play hardball back um, and do things that would be recognized, would be seen as democratically illegitimate by the other side in the interest of democracy? Well, that's a kind of slippery ethical quandary, right? Um, it's hard to know what to do. And I think, you know, I think, you, I think you're right. The Republican Party has become a movement party. The Republican Party has become an anti-democratic party, whereas the Democratic Party, you know, Will Rogers once said, I don't belong to an organized Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat. That still rings true. Um, I think there will be a healthy debate inside the Democratic Party about what to do. But that just highlights the sort of asymmetry of the situation, right? The Republicans have no scruples about moving in this direction. Whereas for the Democrats, it'll be a hard, and I think rightly, a hard decision. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll add a few thoughts here. Um, I'm very concerned about these next few months. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the reasons to do so have been accumulating. I mean, um, the, the danger to free and fair elections, it's, um, just amazing that if you go back just a few years, Americans, the vast majority of Americans of both parties had high confidence in our elections, that they were free and fair elections. And the unraveling of that in a short period of time is really striking. And so, you know, there were concerns mounting um, as uh, voter ID laws are being adopted, um, as the, the Voting Rights Act um, had become weaker and um, after the Supreme Court decision about it, and then Congress hadn't acted to strengthen it again. Um, but then Trump comes along as a candidate and starts talking about fraud in elections. Well, you know, anyone who studies this carefully has found there's, it's not a big concern in contemporary American elections um, to have fraud. Um, and yet that began to undermine um, the Republicans' confidence in elections. And, uh, and then with you know, learning that there was Russian interference in 2016, and then that Trump was asking Ukraine for um, interference in 2020, have made um, Democrats have more and more doubts. And now here we are in the midst of a pandemic and mail-in voting is being disparaged um, and on and on. I mean, it, it seems like every week there is some new danger that is being um, presented to the election that's either a form of suppressing votes or, um, discouraging people from voting or um, danger that votes will not be counted or that the outcome will not be trusted. And, you know, all of these things are concerns. Um, and, um, you know, you can certainly envision a situation where, you know, apparently a lot more Democrats want to do mail-in voting than Republicans. And on election night, it could be that in some states, based on the votes cast that day, that it will appear that Trump has won, but there will be the anticipation of many more votes coming in over the next week that were mailed by election day, that were mail-in ballots. Um, but Trump may declare victory. And, um, you know, or, I mean, that's one of many scenarios that could, lead to um, a great crisis around the election um, and uh, a lack of legitimacy and things being thrown into the courts. I think you know one of the reasons why the Republicans are rushing to fill the Supreme Court seat was articulated by uh, Senator Ted Cruz, who said, we can't have um, uh, four to four votes coming out of the Supreme Court. We need to have a new justice appointed there, in other words, so that um, this litigation will go in the direction of the Republicans. It's a you know kind of um, real um, effort to make sure that the courts are on the side of Republicans in the election. So really treating the courts as very political and um, endangering the concept of free and fair elections. So um, I, I think all of that is a great concern. So how we get from here to November and November to January, I think it's, um, it's going to be as challenging as the election of 1800 was. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the others to, to take Lee's other questions about where do we go um, beyond that if Democrats did manage to, um, to win, to do well in the election. Um, I am 
scared. I can tell from sort of everybody's expressions in response to what Robin and Suzanne were saying that I think we're all just very nervous about the next few months. I think it's just going to be a heightened sense of anxiety, a lot of action um, from the president to, to try to delegitimize the election and the result before it even takes place. I think that we can try to ensure a free and fair election by at least making sure everyone has an opportunity to turn out to vote somehow. You know, if Trump wins, I don't really know what happens next. I'm pessimistic and I don't um, think it's productive to necessarily go there. If Biden wins though, one thing that I wanna push back against Rob about, I don't think that the Democrats historically pay, play hardball necessarily. It's not really their, their way. But I do think that it would be useful to reframe everything in terms of reforming and improving our institutions. You know, we want to live in a country with majoritarian institutions, not counter majoritarian ones. We want clean and nonpartisan election administration like every other advanced democracy in the world. We want less po power in the hands of a highly malapportioned upper chamber of the Senate, like every other advanced democracy. And changing these systems is not constitutional hardball. It is democracy. It is aligning our values, which are ancient, with modern democratic values. And a lot of other democracies have done that. New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan in the 1990s, there's a period of real reform spirit in bringing democracies, to bringing institutions to the modern era. Um, so I, I would really love it if some faction of politicians could articulate guiding democratic principles and bright lines. And the final thing I'll say, which is maybe a little optimistic about if Trump wins is that in places where the far right has been elected to power um, or has come close, they have done very badly. So the Freedom Party was elected to power in Austria and just embarrassed itself with a series of scandals and is no longer in government. The Lega won uh, Matteo Salvini's party in Italy and has, was not able to form a coalition government and ultimately has not been able to govern. Um, and in France, when Marine Le Pen of the National Front, which is called something different now, um, came close to winning, the parties erected a sort of cordon sanitaire to, to insulate the country from her winning, winning office. So I think that if Trump does win, he either governs so poorly that there is an effective backlash, um, or you really start to see leaders um, stop compromising and, and start articulating what our values are actually going to be. Um, so I feel like a lot has been said. I have been over here nodding, shaking my head, saying, yes, that's right. Um, I guess what I'll add to this is I'm, I'm like, I think my fellow panelists here incredibly worried about the future. Um, I like to the point in which like it has been now for many days, I wake up just nervous about what the day is going to bring. It has seemed like this summer has just been a punishing summer. It seems like it has not ended. It seems we are going into this fall and it's been just unrelenting. Um, I will say that I think that one of the, the good things, if there are any good things for me, at least as somebody who's felt right for a very long time that our political institutions are deeply racist, that at least in terms of what has been really interesting, in my opinion, about the Trump administration, it is as many people, as many journalists have said, he said the quiet things out loud and it hasn't just been him, it's been as an entire administration and a whole host um, of Republicans who we suspect. Would, would like sacrifice democracy in this country for their own political gain, but then they just made that completely clear. Um, and so I think for me, in terms of making it like, uh, being very transparent about the stakes, about like, about in terms of people's individual political maneuverings in this moment. Um, and I have felt that there has been a lot of people who I respect politically, um, who have tried to hold the middle, who have tried to be apolitical and or neutral, um, and I don't think that exists anymore. I think like now and hopefully the last few years have been a time for you to figure out where you actually stand on these issues, right? And in so many ways, the spring and summer protests have been the culmination on that, right? That like there's systemic racism, you either stand on the side of where you're gonna address systemic racism or you're part of the problem. There, there is no more room because people's lives um, are in danger. Um, I think for me as somebody who teaches courts and, I've, and obviously like we're not, you guys have, touched on courts throughout this discussion so far. Um, but I've always, I mean, oftentimes people are like, oh, Megan, like he's just like a reality TV president and um, he just like has this big following. But I'm like, I've always been, no, the federal judiciary has changed dramatically. Like the most in terms of the modern presidency under Trump. And he's like, just done it so quickly. And so for many people, especially those who are on the far right, he has given them a new, Federal judiciary. Um, and so like everybody's up in arms as they should be, as they should be. 
um, about the passing of Ginsburg and the Republican response to that. But this has been, I mean, it, it, the institution has shifted. Most of the reason why cases went to the Supreme Court is right because of the conflict at the circuit court level. But like, what happens when all the judges are like Trump appointees at the circuit court level? What happens when the ninth and the fourth agree? I right, like, oh, that's scary. Um, but in terms of, so I, I'm, I'm worried about this election. I think the thing that gives me, in terms of what Rob touched on, the thing that gives me hope and I remain hopeful um, is um, the protest um, and, at, and as well as the activism that I see. I, in terms of, I have never seen this, at least in my lifetime, this number of people being active, calling, emailing, getting their students, getting their family members, to get to, give, to be registered and get to the polls and people becoming politically active. I just, I, so that is giving me excitement and hope. Now, what is giving me pause and giving me worry is everything that I see out there right now. Um, in terms of what happens afterwards, in terms of, uh, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I, a Trump and or a Biden presidency, I think you fight, even if it's Biden still, I think you fight on every corner. I think that part of what has been so successful about the Trump administration is in terms of the development of deep enforcement mechanisms, right? In terms of bolstering ICE, bolstering the police, police unions, et cetera, right? Bolstering the Supreme Court. He has, he has been an institution builder, even if we don't like to believe he has been such. And the left needs to like close ranks and get to it. Um, so I'm not sure at all what's gonna happen, but like, listen here, we can't stop fighting because this is a lot is going on. So I'll end there. All right, so we've got a bunch of questions here. I'm going to try to wrap a couple together. Um, you know, there's a couple questions about the media, about technology, and you know, th their role in you know, potentially accelerating or mitigating a, a, a crisis. You know, and, and in particular, uh, Robert and Suzanne, I'd be interested in, in the, the historical role of the media and technology. I mean, the, the, the media has changed from pamphlets to mass newspapers to uh, to magazines, to television, radio. I mean, the, the media has always been changing. Uh, you know, what what role do you think changing and and cha changing who who controls it? What what role do you think changing media and technology have to play in the kind of weakening or strengthening of, of democracy, both historically? Well, um, it was really striking to us how um, political leaders would use technology, uh, new technologies across our time periods and how they would use um, the media. So um, we go back to uh, the 1790s, like right out of the gate, the partisan media is created in the United States. And it is created by none other than the uh, the framers and the founding fathers, who um, you know themselves might have previously sounded like you know we're all going to govern by consensus, et cetera. So um, you know there is a national newspaper of the government of the Federalists that was the, the sort of the Federalist mouthpiece. So then Jefferson and Madison create their own newspaper um, in order to have an opposition. Uh, voice articulated, and uh, they start, you know, writing anonymous op-eds, and then Hamilton does for the Federalist Paper, where they're um, just um, really tearing each other to shreds, um, and this continues. And and um, you know, I think um, we're very aware of how today we have um, partisan media, you know, epitomized by Fox News and talk radio, etc. Um, and how different that is from the middle of the 20th century when people tuned into the three major networks and heard very kind of middle of the road sort of, of news. Um, and, uh, and when the fairness doctrine was you know, still in place as it was until the, the mid 1980s. Um, but that was actually the ex an exceptional period in the United States in that there were these standards of investigative journalism um, and uh, not a partisan media. But if you look back previously, um, the, the more typical experience was to have a very partisan media that was often really driving um, polarization. It was certainly used in the, uh, not only the 1790s, but 1850s, 1890s to drive polarization. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I think that, and, and then as well, certainly the media can be used to try to 
encourage democratic participation um, and active and informed citizenship. Um, so, you know, I, th I think that it, it can be, um, I, I mean, I'm tempted to say it can be neutral um, and it depends upon who uses it and toward what ends. Rob, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, no, I don't have much to add. I mean, I, I, one other historical moment where this becomes important is the 1890s, where one of the first targets of the white supremacists uh, uh, militias in Wilmington is, it's the Daily Record, is that the name of the paper, Suzanne, the black owned newspaper, and I think the first black owned daily newspaper in the country. Um, their offices are burned down as one of the first salvos of this rebellion in, in Wilmington. Um, so the media is a target and the sort of and recognized as a tool or a weapon of the other side, right? Um, so as Suzanne said, this um, partisan echo chamber like media environment is is not new and in fact um, um, has been with us for a long time. Um, you know, I think there is something to be said for the uh, newer media technologies that make that make um, these partisan narratives and, and, and alternative facts, if you want to call them that, sort of spread with incredibly rapid speed um, and allow people to combine and get together around alternative narratives very quickly and at very low cost. I think that's something new. But again, even that kind of, um, uh, kind of division in attitudes and outlooks that's fueled by the media is not new. I mean, Richard Hofstetter, the great American historian wrote in the middle of the 20th century about what he called the paranoid style, um, which is this sort of um, you know, conspiratorial cast of mind about American politics that was, he documented widely shared um, when that essay first appeared, I think in the 1950s. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that foreshadows the sort of QAnon kind of mentality that seems to be prominent um, in some quarters now. So, so these, th this is a, it's an old pattern, um, um, but, but that doesn't mean it's not something to be concerned about. So we're, we're about out of time. So I, I want to give everybody a, a lightning round chance for final thoughts. But before I do that, I want to mention that if you want to buy the book, and you absolutely should, because not only is it an incredibly informative and, and timely book, but it's it's also wonderfully written, I must say, that the, 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 the narrative of, of these incidents really, really comes together quite nicely. So it's not, it's not one of these like boring academic books that you're going to like fall asleep during you actually I actually really enjoyed reading it um, so you can buy that buy the book under the answered section uh, in, in the Q&A and the link is also available on the event page in, in our uh, uh, on our the New America website all right so lightning round final final thoughts like you know 20 seconds 30 seconds anybody have a final thing that they want to get in yeah, I'll say right. something, and uh, I'll say something that that kind of um, adds to what Rob was talking about earlier when he was talking about race. I was really struck um, in looking at um, contemporary public opinion poll data. I mean, these days, conflict over race is paired with polarization, and um, in the Republican Party, um, which has become an increasingly white party relative to the diversity of the population, whereas the Democratic Party has pretty much kept, uh, has pretty much reflects the diversity of the population today. Republicans have, um, are scoring higher over recent decades on racial resentment scores. Whereas um, when you look at Democrats, Democrats have moved away from those attitudes where they were very similar to Republicans back in the 1980s. They've now become more embracing of equality. So it's a time of both um, peril and promise. We could, um, come through this period of crisis to democracy in a way that restores um, racial hierarchy, as has happened in some periods in the past. It's also possible that this can be a democratizing moment. And I'm heartened to think that I, I think there are more Americans today than ever before who actually embrace the ideals of equality. I think that's part of why we're so polarized, but it also means that there's a lot at stake here and there's the promise for really moving forward. Okay, well, with that optimistic note, 
Uh, let's hope the 2020s are a, are a decade of, of promising political transformation. So thank you all. Read the book, think about it, and, uh, and let's get to work. We've got a lot of work to do uh, to, to strengthen our democracy.